I think we all realize that the technological development is as unavoidable as climate change. So you need to figure out what role do you want to play? Do you just want to let it go and let some of the most important decisions be taken in, in the closed boardrooms? Or would you want to make sure that you can take, take, take them in an open, uh, transparent manner in our democracies? What I think is important is that as a consumer that you have a choice. That you can say, okay, I may want to actually to give you all my data because I trust you, but I don't want to give this other vendor my data because I don't trust them. The huge majority of companies, they work really hard to make a profit and from that they pay their taxes. Uh, and they are faced with competition from companies uh, who do not pay their taxes or to a very small degree would pay their taxes. And that is simply not fair. So Margareta Vestager is the European Commission's Executive Vice President for Europe Fit for the Digital Age. Due to her work as Europe's competition regulator, Margareta has attracted the wrath of some of the world's most powerful people. But she has also been credited with holding the world's most powerful companies to account. Um, and I'm delighted uh, that she is here with us today. So Margareta, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much for, for asking me. I think it's great that you do this because... Uh, one of the first things that we need is, of course, to uh, to talk about what is ongoing in order for action to be taken. So, Margaret, you won't need um, reminding that in 2016, the Apple CEO, Tim Cook, described your efforts to force his company to pay more tax in Ireland as political crap. Um, and three years later, Donald Trump accused you of hating um, the US. Fast forward to this year and the consensus on competition in the tech industry seems to have shifted quite dramatically dramatically. Joe Biden has appointed Lena Khan, an outspoken critic of the US tech giants, as chair of the Federal Federal Trade Commission, and even Beijing is seeking to rein in its largest tech firms. Um, I wanted to ask you, what do you see as the key factors that have changed the perception of antitrust in the tech sector over the last five years? You're really right to know how things have changed because they have changed dramatically. Now there is uh, almost a global consensus among, uh, well, not only democracies, uh, uh, China is also on board here, is that it is 100% legitimate for a democracy to set the framework for how the market should work and what should be the role of market participants, in particular when they are really dominant in the markets where they're active. And it's a, it's a discussion that has increased um, really dramatically. I remember when, when I had my first Google case, I was in the US, I was go walking up and down the hill with my case under my arm and they were like, who's this woman and what is it that she's doing? Um, so I think it has really changed uh, because a lot of, uh, of discussion, a lot of analysis, a lot of thinking, you know, the reports coming out of Canada, the US, uh, uh, Australia, um, Japan, South, uh, South America, basically everywhere you see how that change has been enabled. Hmm. And what, what do you think has, has led to people changing their minds on, on some of these issues? Well, I think, I think we all realize that the technological development is as unavoidable as climate change. Hmm. So you need to figure out what role do you want to play? Do you just want to let it go and let some of the most important decisions be taken in, in the closed boardrooms? Or would you want to make sure that you can take, take, take them in an open, uh, transparent manner in our democracies? I think that choice has been really, really clear. And do, do you feel that you can take some credit for the fact that Washington and Beijing are now taking you know, competition in the tech industry more seriously? Well, I think it's, it's more the businesses themselves. Uh, because they have grown so much, uh, they have become so dominant. Uh, of course, our casework was one of the things to, to highlight it. Uh, the fact that Europe was so much ahead of the curve uh, when it com comes to privacy, I think was, was part of, of you know, uh, putting the light uh, on what was ongoing. But I think it is the actions of the companies themselves that has, you know, pushed this forward because all of a sudden people saw these powers, you know, uh, 
values bigger than many, many countries, uh, so influential, uh, not only in market developments, but also in how our democracy work. And then sort of these sort of wake up calls with no snooze uh, of the Cambridge Analytica scandal and, and latest, of course, uh, the attack on Congress uh, in the US. I wanted to ask um, whether you'd spoken with with Lena Khan. I mentioned, you know, she's been appointed as the, the chair of the sort of FTC in the States. Um, she's arguably, in some ways, your sort of American counterpart. Have, have you spoken to her since she, she took up her role? Yes, we have met uh, virtually, uh, but we will meet, I hope, later this year when I if I get the chance to travel to the US. Margaret, did you did you give her any advice based on your experience on on how she should, you know, con- con- consider going about her work in the States? I really rarely give advice except for myself um, because they have a different uh, legislation. Uh, they have a different approach. I think what we can do is at best to inspire one another mm. Uh, to tell the story about what what is it that you're doing yourself? What are your experiences? Uh, how did it work? Uh, and of course, one of the things that we have seen here is that competition law enforcement is not enough. You need regulation. You need the two to complement uh, one another. Uh, so, of course, it is it's encouraging to see that in the U.S. they're both bringing uh, cases uh, to their courts but they also have a very vibrant uh, discussion uh, in Congress uh, about uh, new uh, regulation uh, to have, I think, uh, I don't think they mirror what we do, but at least to have the same effect. Do you think there are opportunities to to sort of work more closely with the US government on some of these issues now, now that you sort of are sharing more common ground ideologically? Well, I definitely think so. And uh, and one of the, the things that we have been doing is to create this tech and technology council uh, in order to have sort of a high level forum uh, to discuss some of these issues, uh, both uh, politically, uh, but of course, also to inspire as to what can happen in our jurisdictions uh, in a regulatory manner. Uh, of course, it's without prejudice uh, because it is for the European Parliament and for the Council to, to decide here. It's not for anyone else. But I think it's it's important to have this high level uh, forum uh, exactly to be able to have these discussions. Uh, and also in a parallel to that, uh, but independently, we have strengthened um, the competition uh, discussion, uh, the competition dialogue. Uh, that we've been having for a very, very long time uh, with our U.S. colleagues, but but to lift that to a higher and maybe more strategic uh, level. And have you had any dialogue with any of your um, colleagues in Beijing on on these issues? Obviously, there's been a sort of significant increase in in antitrust action in in China generally over the last sort of twelve months. Yeah, not uh, not recently. Uh, we have a, a structured dialogue uh, on digital. Uh, but the latest uh, interaction was uh, just before COVID, uh, so late uh, autumn uh, 19, uh, 2019. Uh, and that was a good, uh, it was a good discussion in, in that respect, that we had sort of a very hands-on discussion about how to make sure that products bought online live up to safety requirements. Uh a policy discussion, uh, sort of where we are see more eye to eye, but also a, of course, a, a discussion where we disagree, mm-hmm. uh, because as you will see in, um, in, for instance, our AI proposal, uh, there are use cases of artificial intelligence that you see uh, in full swing in China that we think should be forbidden uh, within the European Union. That these are not for democracies. And have you had any pushback from? you know, Chinese colleagues or, or business leaders who feel that some of those rules might, might go too far? But, you know, uh, the Chinese uh, companies, uh, despite their enormous size, uh, do not hold a strong market position in Europe. So uh, in, in that respect, uh, not very much. Mm. What we see is an engagement in, in the code of conduct. Uh, we have a code of conduct for, uh, for large platforms. It's in, in the responsibility of my colleague Vera Jourova. Uh, and here they engage, uh, I think, uh, in, in the same manner as we see other platforms uh, engage. Uh, that's a code of conduct. So, of course, it's not legislation or, or law enforcement. Uh, but that is mostly uh, where we see them. I wanted to go back to 
2019 briefly, um, when Ursula von der Leyen was appointed European Commission President, um, you know, she made it very clear that developing Europe's technological sovereignty would be a, a key focus for premiership. Um, and at that same point in time, your role changed from competition commissioner to executive vice president for a Europe fit for the digital age. Um, and your, your remit expanded accordingly. Were you at all worried that by having a sort of twin role focused on, on the one hand, developing digital sovereignty and on the other, holding primarily American tech firms to account, that you would be sort of lending weight to claims that your competition work is is guided by a, a political agenda? Well, that was my first uh, concern, obviously. Uh, even uh, daring to, to ask for, uh, for the work that I do now, um, that, of course, would have to be solved. Because uh, the European Union is, is uh, built on the rule of law. Uh, and it cannot be that there is any suspicion that political priorities is allowed to interfere uh, in our law enforcement practices. Uh, the, the good thing is that we have a, a setup uh, that is really uh, strict when it comes to the, uh, the checks and balances. Uh, you know, an independent hearing officer when it comes to procedural issues uh, the legal service uh, giving independent advice, uh, the chief economist, uh, same thing. So both from a legal side, from an economic side, there is a strong focus on, on the casework in itself, uh, making sure that, that our criteria is whether or not our cases will hold up in court. Uh, and that, of course, is, is uh, really crucial, uh, living in a union built on the rule of law. So those were you know, my first considerations, because otherwise it would not be possible uh, to have these two responsibilities. I guess on the on the sort of flip side of that, there are questions around the extent to which um, a European competition regulator could um, take action against an American company. You know, could um, someone in your position, if you felt uh, that a, a, an American tech firm had... Uh, broken the law in a way that required it to be broken up and and separated into sort of set, you know discrete legal entities. Do you, do you feel like in that case you would have the mandate to actually separate an American company, or or do you think that that would um, potentially you know cause a, a diplomatic rift that would be so deep that it it would be sort of unpalatable in in Brussels? On the one hand side, it is possible. Uh, we have the legal basis. Uh, to do it, um, but at the same time, since it's obviously uh, sort of the most extreme uh, solution uh, to a problem, uh, we we of course will have to try everything else beforehand. Mm. So so we have not been in a situation where we have a, an illegal offence that is sufficiently um, uh, extreme so that we should or could also turn to to the extreme measure of breaking up a company. And the second thing is that um, we're also trying to gain uh, speed in what we do. And and one of the, I think, most obvious things that would happen if you try to break up a company was that the company would seek a, a an order for this not to happen. Uh, so you would have no effect uh, before you were coming out of court, maybe five, six, eight years later. Uh, that being said, uh, of course, I'm acutely aware uh, that competition law enforcement, as we have done it, is not in itself sufficient, which is why uh, we now have the Digital Markets Act in, in order uh, to have sort of, you know, the complementarity of the regulation with the ex-ante uh, approach where competition law enforcement by nature is an ex-post uh, endeavor uh, after illegal behavior uh, may have taken place. So I, I think that is, there, is, uh, there are these two considerations. First, uh, we wouldn't have the cases that would allow us uh, to go into a splitting up of companies. What we're trying to do is to, to get the ne necessary speed to keep the market open and contestable uh, and not to be hung up in court uh, for, for maybe a small decade uh, before any results could be achieved. That's interesting. So it's. Um, I'd like to come back onto the Digital Markets Act um, a little later, but um, just before we get there, 
uh, it's been sort of three years now since GDPR, which is sort of widely regarded as the most far-reaching privacy legislation ever created, came into force. Um, I wanted to ask, what, what do you see as being the, the sort of main consequences of, of that legislation? Well, first and foremost, not everyone knows about privacy, that you know you have rights, that everyone is not allowed in. And I think that is that is really, really important uh, because we live in a world where I think or I fear that many people think that they are just pawns in the bigger scheme of things, that they're not anymore seen as, as individuals with, with dignity and integrity. Uh, and I think privacy uh, legislation has made that very important point. And now you also see it spreading uh, globally, uh, maybe not one-to-one copies, but same line of thinking uh, where legislation is being adopted basically all over this planet. Second thing is that we are still not fully there where people say, okay, I have rights, I can also enforce them. Here, I, I still think that we have some way to go uh, because it is it is really tricky uh, even if you could understand what they are asking you to find the time uh, actually to, to read it uh, uh, and, and get into it. And, and here I, I think that technology should still help us more. Uh, one of the, the benefits of, of digitization is that everyone ought to have an assistant. Back in the days, assistants were only for, for people who could afford to pay you know, another human a salary. In, in digital times, it ought to be more and more common for every one of us to have an assistance system to help us set, for instance, our privacy preferences, our data sharing preferences. And here, I think we still have some way to go. So for, sort of following on from that, one, one of the consequences in, in the sort of last few months of GDPR is that companies such as, as Google and Apple have started introducing greater controls over how advertisers track um, their own users. And some app developers and, and publishers have sort of claimed that by encouraging them into particularly Google's sort of cookie-free tech, um, that they will be sort of accelerating the end of the open web. Um, and I, I know you've launched a, an investigation into um, Google's advertising technology services. And, and one of the aspects of that investigation is is looking at this new privacy sandbox tool. Um, are, are you worried that it, it could hinder competition in the market? The Google sort of, um, uh, ad stack is, is basically completely integrated. Uh, and they hold a very large market share uh, in what they do. So what we are looking at is, of course, uh, how open, uh, how contestable is the advertising market? Uh, because we, we are not preparing the end of advertising. Uh, we also want uh, the advertising market to be open and contestable. And for that, of course, you need to be able to go to different providers. And, uh, and it's also perfectly fair that people can say, I would like to get advertising that suit my preferences. Um, because, you know, advertising can be anything. Of course, it, it can be things that are climate-wise damaging and, and, and what have you, but it can also be advertising for, for better uh, solutions than the one you have today. So, so, so for us, it's, it's really important uh, to balance this out and, and to make sure that smaller businesses have access to a contestable market for advertising to be able to reach their customers. Uh, because you cannot just rely on a search algorithm to be found. Uh, it is completely legitimate also to use advertising to promote your business. On that sort of particular issue around the sort of privacy sandbox, um, I spoke to an economist earlier in the year who said that there may not be a, a sort of perfect e equilibrium where you have as much privacy as you would like and as much competition as you would like. Um, do, do you agree with that? I'm afraid that perfection, no matter how you combine it, is out of reach, no matter what you're thinking about. Um, what I think is important is that as a consumer that you have a choice, that you can say, okay, I may want to actually to give you all my data because I trust you, but I don't want to give this other vendor my data because I don't trust them. 
uh, I think that that kind sort of of of, uh, of data control uh, is really important. This is why we have the Data Governance Act to create entities that can help you neutrally uh, to manage your data. Uh, this is why uh, we want to create this sort of European uh, electronic ID so that you can identify you only to identify you and not just to open the floodgates or whatever data you're creating while being, uh, you know, in, in one service or another. And I think it's important to respect that uh, consumers, citizens have different preferences. Uh, and it's, it's not, um, I think it's really difficult for uh, the legislator or, or the regulator, sort of one and for all, to make that balance uh, because of difference in, in preferences. So we, um, we've done some reporting in the last few months into the influence of, of big, big tech funding on, on academic research into um, you know, the sort of social, economic and political effects of, of digital technologies. Um, are you worried at all about the sort of level of influence that companies, particularly Google, have over sort of supposedly independent research into the tech industry? Well, it, it is a concern of mine uh, because it doesn't seem to be, you know, really labelled. Hmm. We, we do a lot, for instance, if you look at our AI proposal for trustworthy AI, we want any kind of AI that can basically influence your choices to be labelled. You now know that you're dealing with a bot if it's consumer services or something like that. Um, and here we have sort of unlabeled uh, influence. And I think it's perfectly fine if you know who has financed uh, this university chair, who is the main contributor uh, to this uh, NGO. Fine. But if you don't know, uh, I think it is a problem. Uh, because what, what could be, you know, a really um, uh, strong, important uh, insight uh, when it comes to how, how the little guy, uh, Coder, um, could still see himself in a contestable market, uh, of course, that is more trustworthy if they themselves uh, have financed uh, how to get to that insight rather than sort of the giant host uh, financing it. So if it, if it were more transparent, uh, I think it would be so much more legitimate. There's been a lot of speculation in recent weeks about the Commission's plans for um, taxation and a, a sort of European-wide tax policy. Um, could you tell me a little bit about uh, why you, you think it's important to, to update laws around, rules around taxation um, and what the Commission's sort of latest plans are in this area? The, the first point is, is uh, you know, quite simple. Uh, everyone should pay their taxes. The huge majority of companies, they work really hard to make a profit, and from that they pay their taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are faced with competition from companies uh, who do not pay their taxes or to a very small degree would pay their taxes. And that is simply not fair. Because everyone rely on a functioning society uh, being able to hire educated uh, people, uh, driving the roads, then be uh, fiber or, or real uh, asphalt roads. So it's, it's important that everyone contributes. Um, and the second thing is that the, the corporate tax system was invented, you know, decades and decades and decades and decades ago, long before anything anyone thought about tech. So, so to, to update our thinking about corporate taxation is really important. And with the global nature of technology, uh, of course, if we can achieve a global result in doing so, uh, that would be really, really good. Uh, and right now, things look rather promising uh, in the processes there. The second thing is that um, we are now having a, for Europe, a really big uh, recovery and, uh, and resilience fund. Uh, we're going to the market for 750 billion euros. And, uh, and here, uh, Council has agreed that to pay that back, um, we should have more own resources uh, to do so. Uh, and one of the things uh, considered is a, a digital levy, which is not a tax uh, as such. It is, it is indeed a levy. Uh, it has not been decided yet um, because, of course, it will have to dovetail whatever will be the result of the of the global considerations of a renewal of our tax system. So, so in that respect, you know, our driver is this straightforward point of fairness, 
uh, what we can achieve uh, very much depends on what will be the landing zone for a global agreement. Uh, how can that be implemented and how does that then uh, influence our uh, efforts uh, to have own resources uh, to make sure that our um, our next generation fund uh, is financed. One of the companies whose whose tax payments are intensely scrutinised, especially in the UK, is Amazon. Amazon has a, a new CEO, Andy Jassy. Um, I just wondered if you'd spoken with him yet, and if not, whether you, whether you have plans to to meet with him or, or speak with him. Uh, no, I uh, I have not I have not met, uh, and I have no no plans uh, so far uh, to meet. Uh, as you will know, we both have tax cases uh, and we have antitrust cases uh, with Amazon. The latest, uh, this question of, uh, of data sharing, or actually the reverse of data sharing, that the small merchants of the Amazon platform, they don't get their data, but Amazon retail would get their data and can use them to compete against them. So that we have as well as the tax cases. Um, and, and this is ongoing right now. Margaret, there is there's work underway at the moment to... Um, reshore some European chip manufacturing. Um, how important do you think it is that, that Europe has sovereign chip making capabilities? What is important is, of course, access. So, uh, so since this market is a global market and, uh, and different things are needed, uh, Europe has a stronghold in, in the machinery producing chips. Uh, we have a stronghold in the research. Uh, IMAC uh, is uh, the biggest uh, and mo- most renounced uh, chip research institution uh, globally. But there are other things that we don't have. We don't have a giant chip producer of the smallest chips. Uh, and we don't necessarily have access to uh, all the raw material producing chips. So the important uh, thing for us now to figure out is how to make sure that we, ha- we are sovereign in getting the chips that we need, uh, to what degree would that entail production uh, within European borders, uh, or can it do- be done in different ways? Uh, because it is a global uh, supply chain, uh, and it's really important uh, that we get what we need, but also that we promote that we use newer generation of chips, uh, because otherwise we cannot bring down the use of energy uh, in digital solutions. And that is absolutely of the essence, uh, because just as well as there would be no fighting climate change without digital, it must be so that digital cannot remain a part of the problem uh, as it is right now. And, and key to that is, of course, so much more efficient uh, chips uh, to be used uh, and to enable that production. Well, Margaret, I think um, that's probably all we've got time for. But um, thank you so much for, for speaking with me. It's been um, it's been fascinating. No, it was it was my pleasure. And as I said, I'm I'm really encouraged uh, that you take uh, this up. Uh, I know you are really impressive uh, circulation. Uh, so of course, I, I also hope that it will sort of push the debate. I see really interesting uh, developments uh, also also in the UK. So thank you very much for doing this. Thank you, Margaret.